of you would love it if people thought of, like, when your name came to their mind, they thought, man, that person's an idiot. Does anybody, like, have that, like, that desire for your life? Like, I would just love it if people would think of me and think, wow, they are the biggest fool that I know. No, no, no hands going up, no, no heads. I'm trying to get a good look at everybody here. No, I didn't think so. How many of you would love to just make poor choices each and every day? Like you wake up in the morning and you're like, you know what I want to do today? I want to make a poor choice today. No one? No? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page as we get started this morning. And, and before I keep going, I apologize. I know that I'm, I'm going to be way over here, and then all of a sudden I'm going to be way over there. And so if you are watching online, I know that this is really not good for the video, and I try to stop myself, but I can't because there are just, there's awesome people over here, and there's awesome people over there, and there's awesome people in here, and I want to be able to make eye contact with all of you, so I'm all over the place. Plus, we're in a step challenge right now, and I need to get 12,000 steps in before the day's over, and during the first service, I got in 1,500 steps before I was done. So, you know, I'm, I've got a lot of things that are working here, but, but because I know, back to what we're actually talking about this morning, because I know that we don't wake up in the morning wanting to make poor choices and wanting people to think poorly of us because we're foolish or anything like that, um, I got really excited about a month ago when Pastor Mike came into my office, or I should say when I heard Pastor Mike's voice down the hall of the offices, because if you know him very well, you know that he's actually talking to you about 15 seconds before he sees you. And so as I'm sitting in my office and I hear this voice, hey, Justin, do you have a minute? I know that I have about 10 to 15 seconds to answer that question. And my office is set up in a way that I've got a door that goes into the hall where all the other offices are, where he's coming from, but I also have a back door that I can escape out of to go into the youth sanctuary or to just run to the bathroom. Uh, you know, pastors like Pastor Chris over here or Pastor Mike, they love to cut through my office on their way to the bathroom so they can save some steps. Um, and maybe they're in a hurry, I don't know. But I, I was sitting there, I was like, okay, I've got a little bit of time to decide if I want to let him know that I'm actually here and I actually have a minute. And I decided this time, like I do about 98% of the time, to actually stay and to say, yes, I've got, I've got a minute. Now, this is on a Wednesday, so he's coming in on my day where I'm thinking about youth stuff and I am thinking about what's coming up that night and I'm getting prepared for everything um, as far as, you know, getting ready to speak and as far as getting ready, you know, setting up Gaga Ball and Nine Square and all these different types of things. And he comes around the corner and I can tell he's excited. And he comes around and he's like, hey man, do you have February 9th and 10th open on your calendar? And I quickly looked at my calendar, you know, pulled it up on my computer. It's like, yeah, it looks wide open. What's going on? He's like, we are going to get ready to start a new series on that weekend on wisdom. And we're going to take some time in this series and we're going to be asking people in the congregation to send in questions that they have about different areas in their lives where they're seeking wisdom. You know, it could be parenting stuff, it could be marriage stuff, it could be schooling stuff, it could be all these different areas, just areas where people are looking for wisdom. And I'm going to talk about that for about three weeks, but I want you to kick this thing off. I want you to start this. And if you know our senior pastor, you know that when he's sharing this with you, like his excitement is infectious. And so it's starting to, like, I'm getting more and more excited about this. Like, so just so you know, his excitement is so high that he's able to lead middle school games every Wednesday night for about 10 minutes. And you can't do that if you don't have excitement. So he's, he's sharing this with me, and I'm getting excited about it. I'm like, yeah, that, that sounds awesome. Like wisdom, that's a, that's a good thing. I'm passionate about wisdom. I like people to think that I'm wise, whether I am or not. I like people to think that I'm wise. And, and I think most people who are gonna be coming on a weekend, like they wanna be known as wise. And so, yeah, that's great. I'd love to do that. And so about five days later, I actually stopped and I started thinking about what it was that we were going to talk about. Now, granted, this is still three and a half weeks ago, so it's not like I was putting it off until, you know, last Friday or anything like that. But I actually stopped and I started to think about getting up and sharing to people about wisdom. And something hit me at that moment. Out of all the pastors that we have on staff, and I'm going to take um, Pastor Tammy and Pastor Jen off of this one because I am not dumb enough and unwise enough to make this comment about females. But out of all the pastors that we have on staff, I have the fullest and darkest head of hair. 
And I want you to let that sink in for a second as to what that means. That means out of all of our pastors on staff, I'm the youngest pastor that we have on staff. And I started to wonder, did Mike want me to preach this message for some particular reason about myself? Like, did he need me to grow up a little bit? Did he need me to get wise? Because if you look through scripture in Job 12, 12, it says wisdom comes to the aged. And we talk a lot about how, you know, gray hair is a sign of wisdom. And in the case of some, no hair is a sign of wisdom. And I'm sitting here going, I've only got like five grays right in here. That's not true. There's a lot more than that. But I like to only point out those five. And so I, some insecurities, I'll be honest, some insecurities started to sink in at that point. Like, who am I to stand up in front of a lot of people who are going to be my age or older than me, who have kids who are older than my kids, who have gone through a lot more life experiences than I have? Who am I to stand up and to begin talking to these people about wisdom? And finally, you know, God fought my battle for me, and God surrounded me, and God said, that's a lie from Satan, and that's him coming at you with your insecurities about your age and all these things. It doesn't matter. Thank you. It doesn't matter if you're a youth pastor or anything like that and people are still waiting for you to become a real pastor. I can't tell you how many times I hear that one. But it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. If wisdom is important, you can talk about wisdom. And so this morning we're going to talk about wisdom. But just to make you feel a little bit more confident in my ability to have this conversation, I decided that I would write some things on a whiteboard this morning because everybody looks smarter when they write on a whiteboard. So... Paul was nice enough to put this thing together for me last night, and we realized that this thing was originally built for Mike. I walked up and I said, Paul, that thing's awesome. I'm going to write on the bottom half of that thing. And so Paul was nice enough to bring me a step stool. Yes, yes, thank you so much. I might be the youngest, but I'm also one of the shortest. And so we, um, we have a lot of fun on staff with a lot of these different types of things. But the, the Center for Practical Wisdom, just to jump into this, the Center for Practical Wisdom says this about this topic. Wisdom was once regarded as a subject worthy of righteous scholarly inquiry in order to understand its nature and benefits. Like, pfft, that's like a big sentence already, but we're going to keep going. It is difficult to imagine a subject more central to the highest aspirations of being human. The study of wisdom holds great promise for shedding light on and opening up new insights for human flourishing. So the culture in which we live has this to say about wisdom. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. In Proverbs chapter 4 verse 7 which was the scripture that when you were watching that opening video, this was the one that was being searched for and the one that was coming up in the the search. This is written by a man named Solomon, who when God came to him and said, you can ask for anything and I will give it to you. You can ask for anything and I will give it to you. Like, this is a genie in a bottle scenario with God where he's like, ask me what your wish is and I will give it to you. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. And so God says, that's an awesome answer. I'm also going to make you filthy, filthy rich. And if I'm Solomon, I'm like, whoa, man, I'm glad I chose that answer. But no, wisdom is what he chose. And so the wisest man to walk wrote these words in Proverbs 4, verse 7. He says, above all and before all, do this. Get wisdom. Get wisdom above all else, above fame, above popularity, above money, above all of these things. Get wisdom. And so he did. And then he told us, as he was inspired by God, that this is what you need to do. Because you don't want to go through life making unwise choices. You don't want to go through life being known as the person who always does dumb things. So if you're looking for a why this is important to look at, it's right there. Two of them for you. One, scripture tells us we should do it. And number two, we don't want to look like fools. And I'm a youth pastor. And as a youth pastor, we know that for every what you give somebody, you need to give them two whys. So that's why I just gave you two whys before we even jump into this thing. Because I know that if I'm sitting there listening to somebody, I'm wanting to know what the purpose behind listening to them is. 
And so I wanted to throw that out to you right off the bat. This morning, we're going to look at what wisdom is not. We're going to look at what wisdom is. We're going to look at how you can get wisdom. And we're going to look at the who as to who has wisdom. How can we know that somebody has wisdom? So first, if you're looking at this, wisdom, see, I already look smarter, don't I? And shorter. Wisdom is not the same as knowledge. And I think this is an answer a lot of people would give if they were being asked, what is wisdom? They would say, well, it's, it's knowing things. Wisdom, you know, for a lot of people, wisdom is getting good grades. Wisdom is knowing what's going on in the world around us. Wisdom is having knowledge. And I can tell you, 11 years ago, I sat down at my desk for the very first time as a youth pastor in Fort Collins, Colorado, after going through four years of university training with a youth and music degree, as a, as after growing up in a home with two incredibly wise parents who were always trying to point me down the narrow path that, that I would constantly roll my eyes at, who, um, who had opportunities to do three separate internships, one of them being with Highland Park while I was in college. After going through all of that, I sat down at my very first desk as a youth pastor, and I got it all set up, and I had my shelf full of books over here, three quarters of which I'd never cracked the cover of, but I had a bunch of books because that's what you're supposed to do, and I sat down and I went, what in the world do I do now? Like, I have all of this knowledge inside of my head. I've read all of these textbooks. I've gone to theology class. I've gone to youth ministry classes. I've read the purpose-driven youth ministry and the, perfect, or the purpose-driven church. I should be ready for ministry. I am ready to go. And I sat there and went, I, I have no idea. Like, how do I figure out what I'm supposed to talk to these students about? What am I supposed to do when that student comes to me and they're just completely broken and they're torn down and they need me to speak something into their lives? What in the world am I supposed to do? 11 years ago, that's what was going through my mind. Because knowledge is not the same as wisdom. I want to introduce you guys to what I think is a really awesome resource that some of you have probably viewed or some of you have probably used, but it's a resource, a video series called The Bible Project. If you go up into our youth hallways, you'll actually see on the walls of our youth hallways like these comic strip looking things on the walls that have the names of books of the Bible above them. And it just, it walks you through a summary of that book of the Bible in comic book form. That's one of the many things they do, but they also put together videos that take you through books of the Bible or take you through concepts in the Bible, words of the Bible. And so rather than me standing up here the whole time and telling you what wisdom is, I'm going to let the Bible Project give you some insight into what wisdom is this morning. So would you turn your attention to the screen? The wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And all of these books are addressing the same set of questions. What kind of world are we living in? And what does it look like to live well in this world? So how to be good at life. Yeah. So each of these books tackles these questions from a unique perspective. And it's important to understand all of them to get a fully biblical perspective on the good life. So as a thought experiment, you could actually imagine each of these books as a person. So Proverbs would be like this brilliant young teacher, and Ecclesiastes is the sharp middle-aged critic, and Job would be this weathered old man who's seen a lot in his day. We're going to start by meeting the book of Proverbs, the brilliant young teacher. And she's not just smart, she's smart about everything, work, relationships, sex, spirituality. She has incredible insights. Things you wouldn't see on your own. Yeah, she would be the perfect friend to have around when you need really specific advice. So what makes her so smart? Well, Proverbs can see things that most people don't see. She believes that there's an invisible creative force in the universe that can guide people in how they should live. And you can't see it, just like you can't see gravity, but it affects everything that we do. So what's this force? Well, in Hebrew, it's called chokhmah. And it usually gets translated into English as wisdom. It's an attribute of God that God used to create the world. And chokmah has been woven into the fabric of things and how they work. So wherever people are making good or just or wise decisions, they're tapping into chokmah. And whenever someone's making a bad decision, they're working against chokmah. Right, or as it says in Proverbs chapter 1, the waywardness of fools 
will destroy them. But the one who listens to wisdom lives in security. So it's like a moral law of the universe. Yeah, it's a cause-effect pattern, and no one can escape it. And Proverbs personifies all of this as a woman. Yeah, Lady Wisdom. Right, and she roams around the earth calling out, making herself available to anyone who's willing to listen to her and to learn. Which leads to the second thing Proverbs believes, that anyone can access and interact with wisdom and use it to make a beautiful life for yourself or for others. You can create with it like a designer. Yes, in fact, chokhmah in Hebrew isn't simply intellectual knowledge. The word is also used to describe a skilled artisan who excels at their craft, like woodworking or stonemasonry. So you show you possess chokhmah when you put it to work and develop the skill of making a good life. Okay, that makes sense. So let's do this. Let's go find some wisdom. But before you do, Proverbs has one more really important thing to consider. Chokmah isn't some impersonal force. It's an attribute of God himself. And so in Hebrew thought, your journey to becoming wise has to begin with what Proverbs calls the fear of the Lord. It's this healthy respect for God's definition of good and evil. And true wisdom means learning those boundary lines and not crossing them. Now, all those ideas you just unpacked are in chapters 1 through 9 in Proverbs. But when I think of the book of Proverbs, I think of the collection of sayings, the Proverbs themselves. Tell me about those. Yeah, those are what you find in chapters 10 on to the end of the book. It's a collection of hundreds and hundreds of Proverbs about any and all aspects of life. And chokmah gets applied to them, resulting in this wise guidance to help you find a path towards success and no matter what you do. If I design my life with these sayings, life is going to be good. Yeah, or as Proverbs puts it, it'll give health to your bones, prosperity, a long, rich life. Which is a really big claim. But you can see how it's often the case. Wise people, they tend to do better. Things usually work out well for them in life. And so that is the promise and the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is really beautiful. But if we take a step back, some people would argue it's a little too simplistic. Because sometimes horrible things happen to really wise people, and sometimes foolish people get rewarded. It doesn't always work the way we think it should work. That's right. Which is why we need to go and listen to our next wise friend, Ecclesiastes the Critic. Because he's wrestled with that very problem, and he's going to push us further in our journey to find the good life. So I would encourage you to take some time and watch the next two videos in that series on Ecclesiastes and Job. But as we look through that one, we see a lot of attributes of what wisdom is and a lot of explanation as to what wisdom is. I know that it's a lot to to process at one moment. I've watched that video several times, and I feel like every time I watch it, I glean something else from it, which is kind of what happens every time we read Scripture, that every time we go through it, it's like, oh, I didn't notice that before. I didn't think of that before because the Holy Spirit is constantly talking to us. But one of the attributes that we noticed or one of the descriptions that it gives for wisdom, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I also don't want to ignore it because men, I think this is really important for us to catch on to. What did the book of Proverbs describe woman as? A what? Did you catch it? Not a teacher. See, I do this with my students, so I'm doing it to you too. Not a man, but a, a woman. Knowledge or wisdom was described as a woman. And men, I don't want to, like I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I'm just going to get myself in trouble. But listen to the women in your lives. I believe the words that my dad told me one time when he said, hey, you're going to make a lot of big decisions in your family. Listen to Sarah's intuition because God seems to speak to women in a way that he doesn't seem to, or I should say that men don't seem to listen to God. So men, listen to the women in your, lo- in your lives. Women, tell my wife that I said that. All right. So it, it was described as a woman. Oh, I can't believe I just caught that. I feel pretty good about myself. It was described as a woman, but it was also described as the fear of what? The fear of the Lord. It was an attribute of God. It was the fear of the Lord. And in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I remember growing up and sitting in my grandparents' Lincoln Continental town car right after a... um, 
uh, what do you call it, a, a camp, camp meeting service had gotten over. And we're sitting in this car, and I don't remember what my grandparents said. I don't remember what question they asked. But I remember my answer was, I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of God. And I remember them turning around and looking at me. This is when they were significantly younger and they could actually still turn around in the front seat of their car. But I remember them turning around and looking at me and saying, what do you mean you're afraid of God? I said, well, that's what the Bible tells me to do is that I'm supposed to be afraid of God. You know, in my mind, as a little kid, I was sitting there thinking, yes, I'm, I'm afraid of him, like, you know, because he could destroy me at any second because he's so big. And so obviously, I'm going to be afraid of this guy. I said, no, 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 no. I, I cannot thank my grandparents enough for this. But they said, no, 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 no. When it says the fear of the Lord it's not talking about like your boots or you're shaking in your boots and your knees are knocking and you're hiding under the covers in the middle of the night because obviously you can keep out anything scary with a piece of cloth. It's not that kind of fear that it's talking about. It's talking about a reverence for him. It's talking about an understanding of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's a, as the video said, it's a healthy respect for God. And so as we look at the beginning of wisdom, it's not just, it's not just knowledge that we are looking for, but it's actually an understanding of things. I kind of, I think of it this way, you know, I don't need, and I don't believe I ever have, I don't need to put my hand on a hot stove in order to know that it's going to do bad things to my hand if I touch it. Now, I've heard of other people doing this, and so that's partly where I've learned that I don't need to do this, but also I understand this thing called heat, and I understand what heat can do to me, so I don't have to put my hand on it in order to all of a sudden have a wisdom and an understanding that it's going to hurt me. Or looking at it another way as we look at what this looks like in our lives, knowledge is what I, was, I would refer to as book smarts. And book smarts are good. Knowledge is a good thing. But understanding is having street smarts about things. And we know, those of us who have lived a little bit more life, we know that as you get to, you know, out of the book stage of your life, that things don't always line up exactly how it was looking in the books. That reality doesn't always look just like it looked when it was in this picture-perfect, purpose-driven youth ministry book. That life is messy and we have to have some street smarts when we get out there. And the street smarts are when we begin to put that knowledge to work. When it begins to mean something to us. When we begin to understand the why that knowledge existed in the first place. There's a, a story of a man that Dr. Henry Cloud tells. There's a story of a, a CEO of a dog food company who was meeting with some of the top people in his, in his organization, and they weren't selling enough dog food. And if you're a dog food company and you're not selling enough dog food, obviously things aren't good. So he's sitting there, and he's talking to them. He's like, guys, we've got to figure out what this problem is. And they're talking about it, and finally he's like, look, I know what the issue is. The issue is that it's our marketing like, our advertising is not good enough. So he fired his entire marketing team. And he, he went out and he hired a new marketing team. And they came back a month later and they still weren't selling any more dog food. And so they had the discussion again. And he, he finally came to the conclusion that, you know, the problem, okay, it, it wasn't the marketing team. That was on me. The problem is that our sales team isn't good enough. Like, obviously, if you're not selling then it's the sales team fault. So he fired his sales team and he hired a new one. And this is a true story, at least Dr. Cloud says it's a true story. And he comes back a month later and they're still not selling food and finally one guy in the back of the room raises his hand and he just says, sir, I think I know what the problem is. The problem is that the dogs don't like it. The, the dogs don't like the food. We can advertise as much as we want, and we can sell as hard as we can, but if they don't like it and they're not going to eat it, then we're not going to get anywhere. And the CEO had a choice at that point. The CEO had a choice of, I can either take the truth. Let me draw my little guy here first. I always forget to draw him. There we go. I can either take the truth, and I can bend the truth to myself. Like my truth, we hear that phrase a lot, my truth 
is that the marketing team isn't good enough. The sales team isn't good enough. You're not good enough at your job. I'm, maybe I'm not good enough at my job. I can bend the truth to myself or I can adjust myself to the truth and understand that we just need to fix the food. And we just need to make it taste better. A wise person is exposed to the light and doesn't try to make the light bend to them, but instead, they bend to the light. And they understand that it isn't about making everything in the world adjust to me. It's about me adjusting to the truth that God has put out into the world. A wise person, according to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9, a wise person sees feedback, sees instruction as a gift that's coming to him or her. Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. If you look at other Proverbs that are in Scripture, you see that it says, instruct the fool, and you're wasting your time. They're just going to insult you, and they're just going to come back at you. So you can be one of those two things. You can be the one who takes good feedback and listens to it and be described as wise, or you can ignore it and you can try and say, no, 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 it's this. I'm going to put the blame on this. I'm going to put the blame on that. What do you want to be? Do you want to be considered the wise person or do you want to be considered the foolish person? Do you want to make good choices, wise choices, or do you want to make foolish choices? Real quickly, I just want to give you a couple different ways that you can go about beginning to make those wise choices because I know that we're all sitting in here and we can look at things that we've done and say, I've made some unwise choices in my life. And some of us might look at our lives and be like, I'm just not a real wise person. Like I haven't just made some unwise choices. My life is full of unwise choices. And I don't want to be that anymore. How do I go about this? For the next three weeks, Pastor Mike's going to be talking about some more specific areas that we can look at. But I just want to give you something to get started on this week. And the first of those is that Proverbs tells us that if you want to be wise, you put yourself around other wise people. You know, this this goes into so many different areas of life. I've always wanted to be a good basketball player. And when I was... uh, in a a different stage of my life, I spent a lot of time playing basketball and there was a stage where I thought I was getting really good. Like I was was better than everyone I was playing with and then I went out and I played with some other people that were actually my age and not 10 years younger than me and all of a sudden I realized I am not good at basketball. (laughs) I've been playing with people who aren't as good and that made me feel good but as soon as I got around people who were better, it became very evident that I was not a good basketball player. If you want to be good in business, you surround yourself with people who have made good business decisions. If you want to have a good marriage, put people in your lives, find people to put in your lives that have good marriages that you can learn from. Teenagers, if you want to get good grades in college or in, a, in high school or middle school or whatever it is, if you want to get good grades, Don't spend all of your time hanging out with the friends who only play Fortnite and don't do their homework. Hang out with people who take their schooling seriously. Now, I'm not saying Fortnite and all that kind of stuff is bad. I'm saying hang out with people who take seriously what you take seriously. They say that we will be the average of the people that we hang out with. That we're not going to be the best. We're also not going to be the worst But if you're putting the bar of the best down here, then you're ending up down here. And so if you want to be wise, put yourself around wise people. This is a great tool that you can use community groups for. Is put yourself around other people who are seeking the same thing that you're seeking. Who maybe have gone through more than you have gone through. Who if you're a parent with young kids, who they've gone through parenting with young kids. And they can help you make those wise decisions so that you don't have to go to the Magic 8 Ball. Which yes, we live in Wyoming and of course they have a camo one. That you don't have to go to the, the Magic 8 Ball to figure out how to parent your children. Or how to respond to your crying wife. Or how to, you know, how to figure out if you should leave that dirty diaper for your your spouse and act like you didn't know about it. You don't have to go to the magic eight ball to figure all these things out, but instead you can go to people who have actually gone through those things before. And as simple as it sounds and as churchy as it sounds, you've got to open up this book. 
Watching a video that's five minutes long is awesome. I mean, that video, I love that video. It gives me a lot of insight into wisdom, but that was five minutes. This has a lot more than five minutes worth in it. Right now in youth, we're getting ready to kick off a series. We were supposed to kick it off last Wednesday, but then we had weather, so we're going to kick it off this Wednesday. And we're going to be talking about sex and purity. And a lot of students, when I brought that up two weeks ago, they're like, oh, I don't want to. And a lot of parents are like, I don't want you to. But here's why we do that. Because we can tell our students and our, your children, we can tell them over and over again, God says don't have sex until you're married. And we can fill their minds full of this knowledge, but that knowledge doesn't help if they don't understand why. And when you open this up, you begin to see the why God has that as a standard. The why God designed it to be that way. And it's not just sex and it's not just purity. It's so many different things. Why does God say we shouldn't steal? Why does God say we shouldn't kill? Why does God say we shouldn't lust? Why does God say, why does God say? And when you begin to understand the whys, you begin to have some wisdom about those things and some understanding about those things and not just listening to people tell you don't do, don't do, don't do, but do this, do this, do this. And you're sitting there going, okay, I've got all this knowledge, but what am I supposed to do with it when I'm actually in the situation that I need it? You open the book and you begin to see the why behind things. And then finally, and I don't think you can get any simpler than this, but James 1 chapter 5, the brother of Jesus writes the words, if any of you lacks wisdom, what should you do? Ask for it. If any of you la lacks wisdom, it's a three-letter word, ask. And we look at that and we're like, that's way too simple. There's no way it's that easy. I mean, I remember growing up as a child thinking, my parents will never do this for me. My parents would never give this to me. And now that I'm a parent, I understand that my parents were waiting on me to ask the question. They, were, they would have loved to have done more stuff for me. I mean, again, they were great parents, but they would have loved to have done more. They would have loved to have given me more. But so many times, I just thought in my mind, they're not going to say yes. Or, or that's just, that's too easy. You know, I'm just going to do all my own work to get it instead. And that's probably why I went to college broke for the last 15 years of my life. Because I failed to ever just ask them for help. And God says, through James, if you lack wisdom, ask me for it. Not putting your faith in other things, not putting your faith in other people, but ask me for wisdom. I might point you to some other things. I might point you to some other people. But I've made a promise to you that I will give it to you if you will ask me for it. We need to stop overcomplicating it. Maybe we need to start by asking him instead of starting by asking Google what we should do or YouTube what we should do. I've got a dad who's a mechanic, and the first thing I go to when my car breaks down is Google, where I could save so much time if I would just go to my father and say, hey, this is going on, what can I do? And then he can go Google it and tell me what it is that I need to do. <laughs> Ask him for it. I don't want to make it more complicated than that. You get yourself around other people that are wiser than you, not just your buddies, not, you know, not going to the psychic and checking out the crystal ball, not watching Dr. Phil, not just making a guess. You get yourself around other people who are wiser than you. You open up your book and you ask God for wisdom. And if you're one of those people I talked about earlier that you're sitting there like, I've already made way too many unwise choices in my life. Like, there's no coming back from this. Guess what? You might have some earthly consequences for those no matter what. But we have a God who says, you know what? If you will just ask, I have already forgiven you. And I am already ready to take all that stuff and wipe it away. And we can start today, if you will just ask, with making wise choices and living a life of wisdom so that you don't have to be looked at as the person who makes poor choices and who's a fool. 
You can be wise. I'm excited about this series. I'm excited to see what questions you guys have asked that Pastor Mike is going to come up here and talk about. Because I know that none of us, and you guys admitted this at the beginning, I know none of us want to go through life just making a bunch of poor choices one after another. And so today, no matter where you've been, you can start down that path with that three-letter word, ask. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much for, for making it that simple. And I apologize for myself for making it so much more complicated than that. God, I apologize that when I'm looking for wisdom that I go to, I go to Google, I go to YouTube, I go to so many different sources before I finally just come to you and say, God, I need you to clarify this for me. I need you to give me an understanding on this, God. So God, my prayer right now is that before we do all those other things, that we would all just come to you and just ask. And God, we thank you for being a God of your promises. We thank you for being a God who doesn't lie, a God who doesn't, who doesn't draw back, but who says, I've made a promise and I'm going to fulfill it. God, I pray that we would be able to be patient in the waiting of the fulfillment of that promise. And we pray this in your name. Amen.